Hello, everybody, and welcome to this presentation for the Aggression Sessions charity event. Uh, my name is George Mycock. I'm the founder of Myominds. As you, I don't know if you can see me on the recording, but I've got the jumper on. Um, this presentation is going to be talking about keeping fitness healthy. So just an introduction about myself and what I do. Uh, as I said, my name is George Mycock. I am the founder of Myominds. Myominds are a mental health community, a mental health organization that works to demystify mental health and make sharing mainstream within the exercising community. So by exercisers, we mean anyone who does exercise from walking your dog to being an Olympic athlete. Uh, we're here to try and you know, help demystify mental health and make sharing mainstream with, with that community itself. Um, my, I also have lived experience with a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I have um, been diagnosed with an eating disorder. Um, I have kind of self-diagnosis of muscle dysmorphia and um, the exercise addiction stuff that we talk about has is, is definitely played a, a huge part in my life uh, up to this point. And as part of, um, you know, th these experiences, I, I am also a lover of fitness. I'm someone who goes to, well, I, I don't go to the gym at the moment because it is, it's currently closed, but yeah, I'm someone who um, trains and exercises, you know, several times a week. Uh, I have I've always done so ever since I was about 15 years old. I am a huge lover of it. Um, and I am no way, and as I'll touch on as we go on, I'm no way saying that um, exercise is a bad thing or that um, people shouldn't do it. In fact, I, I am a lover of it myself. So yes, as we continue. Um, so first up, uh, exercise is has been quoted as the wonder drug for mental health, and it's kind of a wonder drug for a lot of things. There are some incredible positive sides of exercise. Um, on the NHS website, there's you know several um, reports of these statistics showing how it can have an impact on both physiological and psychological conditions. So I won't read them all off, but you can see here it up to a 35% lower risk of cor cor coronary heart disease and stroke. There's a 50% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. There's a 30% lower risk of early death. You know, and on top of that, there's also an up to 30% lower risk of depression and dementia. Um, and a, a recent kind of meta-analysis by Mickelson et al. in 2017, they kind of quoted at the very start of their paper that you know, the general outcome from research indicates that exercise can bring uh, many physiological changes which can result in improvements of mood mood state so that's self-esteem and also lowers the stress and anxiety levels of these individuals who begin doing exercise but um, as with many things um, fitness and having a, a so-called healthy lifestyle can go too far and I'm going to talk about three of the ways in which they can go too far today and hopefully shine some light on what we can do to stop um, or at least, you know, um, limit how often this is happening. Um, and so, you know, today I'm going to talk about exercise addiction. I'm going to talk about eating disorders and I'm going to talk about body dysmorphia. So a question I often get or something that people tend to say to me um being the the guy that talks about the negatives of exercise is you know why bother talking about the negatives you know um am i saying that you shouldn't be pushing yourself to exercise harder you shouldn't be trying to make these healthy choices you shouldn't be monitoring your diet and you know be you know making these you know, what have been shown to be outwardly healthy healthy choices in in science and um in the in the kind of field um, and that's that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to increase awareness. Um, increasing awareness increases health literacy. So the individual, you know, yourself or other people listening or people that you may go and explain this talk to or share this with, um, they hear me talk about it. They get gather a better understanding, improve that uh, literacy, that health literacy around these conditions, around these behaviors. And then that has been shown to lead to improved help seeking behavior. So actually you're going and getting help from a professional 
um, and also you know increasing your help seeking increases your general well-being uh, so you know people actually start to feel better so i'm not trying to stop people from doing it i'm trying to increase their understanding of how things can go wrong and, and you know, where things go wrong so that then they can spot it in themselves and be like oh i need to go and get help or spot it in a friend and think oh i should probably offer them some support um, and then, you know, those people who are struggling can then go and get some help. So first off is exercise addiction. So there are two main um, ideas around an exercise addiction. There's both the primary exercise addiction and a secondary ex exercise addiction. So exercise addiction itself is basically the idea of um, doing exercise uh, rapidly or you know obsessively and um, compulsively and being dependent on it and um, actually the mike trot who who i've quoted at the bottom there he says that exercise addiction is a good term because it it combines both the compulsivity of of it and also the dependency of it so you know it's needed that you know it's compulsive behavior but also um the person depends on it they they you know, again they need they need to do it so primary EA um, is when the exercise addiction is the primary or main symptom. So it's not part of an eating disorder. It doesn't involve eating disorders, so to speak, um, but it can still be very dangerous. It doesn't seem to have as much of an effect on um, the kind of psychological or the, the mind state of people. Some research show that people who um, express a primary exercise addiction behavior actually don't seem to have a different um, well-being to people who just don't have exercise addiction at all. But there are also some dangerous things that can come along, in, including this relative energy deficiency in sport, which I don't talk about too much today, but um, you can learn about it on the Maya Minds podcast if you want to go check it out, or I'll give you a little brief explanation now. It's basically REDS is the... Um, amalgamation the collection of possible symptoms that come along with a low energy availability and one of the ways that you can become into that state of low energy availability is through exercising excessively or too much um, so you know even though there might not be that mental state the primary exercise addiction can actually um, cause this, these physiological um, issues and secondarily is the secondary eating um, sorry exercise addiction um, which is when the exercise addiction is showing as a secondary symptom on, alongside an eating disorder. So this person's um, eating disorder is is or you know disordered eating behaviour is being um, kind of contributed by this exercise addiction. So exercise is playing a part alongside this um, these behaviours and and thoughts and this negativity around eating as well. Um, so you know it can again it can it can lead to reds and often even at an accelerated rate because especially if the person is um, under eating as part of their disordered eating or eating disorder and um, then that energy availability is going to get lower quicker. And also um, you know it can lead to the um, increased psychological issues that can then lead to even further increases in the like physiological um, behavior so you know, if you're if you're becoming more conscious and um, have more anxiety around food then you may start to eat even less or you may start to exercise even more um, and then that can accelerate the rate of the issues that come so you know Hank how can we tell the difference between just exercising a lot and exercise addiction you know, that's something that um, I've spoken with coaches and stuff as part as part of my work with Maya Minds and a lot of the questions we often get or I often get from people is, um, you know, I have athletes who have to exercise a lot or they do exercise a lot. How am I supposed to know if it's an addiction or if it's just them exercising a lot? And it's a, it's a great question. Um, one really kind of, um, in, I would say, important thing to to consider. Um, and it's, it, it's not, it doesn't fit everyone and you know, I, I don't think I could um, make a presentation that it would be under <laughs> under like three days long um, that would cover all the bases. But I feel like this is quite a good um, starting point. So uh, there's these positive and negative feedback loops that often feed into an exercise addiction. And one thing to look out for is the conversion from a positive into a negative. Um, a negative feedback loop tends to be more of an issue um, and often brings that kind of extra anxiety, et cetera. And I'll explain how. So as you can see on the left here, there's the positive feedback loop. So 
the person exercises more in the top left. Um, they that moves to you know they feel this reduced anxiety. This is just one example, or you know it could be anything. Could be loss of weight or you know whatever. They feel this positivity thing, um, this thing that they they feel positive about, um, and then they decide, okay, I want to exercise more because that feels good, and um, you know I or I like the results I'm getting, so I'm going to exercise more. And that can be an issue as well as we spoke about, you know, with with reds. Um, but psychologically, that do, doesn't seem to be. Um, as affecting as, as it, when it switches to what is instead a negative um, feedback loop. So if you look over onto the other side, the negative feedback loop, and um, there's a slight change here, which is, you know, the person still exercises more, they feel this reduced anxiety or whatever symptom it is. And, um, but this time they feel actually what I need to do now is I need to exercise more so that my anxiety doesn't come back. So you can see it's quite a subtle change. Um, and I've highlighted the words want and need because you know, on the positive side, it's I want to do more, whereas on the negative side, it's that I need to. Um, and the, the word need carries that fear or that um, fear of guilt that can come. You know, guilt is, is one of the kind of um, big buzzwords in, in this, in the fact that um, if a person is worried about feeling guilty or just has the, has the, the feeling of being guilty um, because they didn't exercise enough or they felt they didn't exercise in the way that they wanted to, that can be a driver for um, you know, disordered eating and also further exercise addiction. So it's really important that we um, you know, look out for these. And, and you can kind of see, I can give an example of how someone can um, transfer across to this, you know. So the classic, a really good example is um, some somebody starts running. Um, as they're running, they start to, um, they, they, they again, you know, they feel that they're a bit happier, their mind's clearer, and they think, oh, this feels really good, so I'm going to run some more. And you know, their, their anxiety goes down, and they're, they're happier, and this, this has an effect on their relationships. You know, people seem to be happier towards them, and then people seem to, you know, want to, to speak to them more, and then they think, oh, this is great. Um, but somewhere along the line, it switches to, oh, what if I lower my exercise now what if i stop exercising as much what if um you know i i don't do what i'm currently doing what if i don't keep increasing it are people going to start to not like me as much as my anxiety going to come back okay now i need to do this i need to keep increasing it in order to make sure that these benefits are coming my way and and you know more importantly to make sure that these negatives don't come so you can see there how it, it can quite easily switch over so on to eating disorders or disordered eating. So there are, you know, I would say th these three that I've got here are the, the more commonly known eating disorders. Um, on the top, we have anorexia, which, you know, is, is often um, around the idea of um, severe restriction or total aversion to um, food intake. So, you know, someone... Um, it just doesn't eat or eats very little and then often exercises a lot. That exercise addiction tends to play a, a big role there. Um, then there's bulimia, which is characterized by the binging and purging behaviors. So a binge is this kind of loss of control, you know, having to eat um, a lot of food or just you know, feeling that they need to eat a lot of food. It's kind of like compulsive. Um, and then there's some sort of purging behavior. So you know, the more commonly known ones, known one is the um, self-induced vomiting, um, but there's also you know, the use of laxatives and actually the use of exercise. So somebody you know, binging on a lot of food and then deciding they need to go do run half a marathon or you know, just run until they throw up or, or whatever it is, um, that can also be a characteristic of bulimia. And finally, is binge eating disorder. Um, the Eating Disorders Awareness Week uh, of, of this year, 2021, uh, actually made this kind of the, the theme. Um, binge eating disorder is, is, is quite similar to bulimia, um, but without the purging behavior. So that individual feels um, the need to, uh, you know, has this compulsion to, I have to eat a lot for whatever reason. If it Normally it's kind of um, alongside this, uh, a moment of shame or a moment of stress. Um, and they feel that they need to rectify it in some way, or you know, there's comfort in that. Um, and people who have eating disorder, I myself have, have, have um, binge eating disorder, or you know, have a form of it. Um, there's often this kind of disassociation with the the, the person, so to speak, in, in air quotes, um, 
who is eating all this food because you know that that's not going to help or that you kind of you feel like you know that 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 never makes you feel better in the long term so why do you keep doing it and often you have this kind of shame of who that person is and you you know you don't feel um comfortable sharing that and that can you know all th- all three of these eating disorders can lead to like social anxiety because of you know you can become anxious of, of how you look or who you are or you know who this other person is in in the, the version of binge eating disorder so but one thing that's really important in eating disorders um, and i can't stress this enough is that they are a psychological condition they are not physical um, I think often if, if we hear the word anorexia, we picture someone who is thin and, and severely underweight, but actually someone can be obese or, um, you know, you know, overweight according to their BMI or whatever, um, and actually have anorexia. It's, it's a mental health issue. So the, the behaviors and the thought process be, processes behind anorexia. So the, the fear of food, the shame of eating, um, the severe restrictions of food, the excessive exercise or exercise addiction can all take place in somebody who is overweight. And again, this is something that um, I have experienced with. I had an injury on my back when I was younger and I gained a lot of weight and I was, uh, my BMI, I was even morbidly obese or obese. I was, I was, um, you know, I was, I was very high BMI. Um, and I started anorexia behaviors. I, I started restricting my food significantly. I started exercising like excessively, but I was encouraged to continue because people don't, you know, it, people don't realize that it can be in any, any body shape. And the same goes for all these three eating disorders. And, um, you know, they, it can affect anyone. And talking about um, it affecting anyone, um, I want to talk about these two less known eating disorders and they're not as, as at least at the point of me recording this, they are not um, fully diagnosable yet as in they're not in the um, diagnostics manual. Um, so people can't be officially diagnosed with these, but they, they do seem to be creating some traction and seem to be actually quite prevalent, especially in the exercising and fitness communities. So I wanted to touch on them. The first up is muscularity oriented disordered eating. So this is the form of disordered eating that surrounds um, instead of a goal of trying to become thin or skinny or lose weight like we, not, we normally associate with um, eating disorders. Actually, this individual is trying to become um, bigger, like more muscular, but also trying to be leaner and you know, have that mus- muscularity look. Um, and it's actually it seems to be more common in, in men than in women. Um, but you know, I think, I think it can be shown in in both. Um, and I I think, um, at least the research seems to, to show that this is probably due to the body ideal of, um, the masculine, the male body ideal is often associated with some, as somebody who is, um, you know, big, big chest, big arms, big shoulders, and you're very lean, you're six pack abs and, and has that kind of those veins and the muscularity that is associated with that. Um, and it, and it, you know, that kind of get linked, gets linked to being masculine and being, um, you know, a, 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 again, in air quotes, a man, so to speak. So men often feel like they need to look like that in order to be a man, in order to be masculine, in order to live up to what society tells them they need to be. And the, and one of the big issues with, um, muscularity oriented disordered eating or mode, I'll call it, um, is that they're quite contrasting um, goals, you know, to, to become bigger and muscular and, and do drive a, a size, a, like muscle mass size requires a calorie surplus. You need to be eating more food than, than you're burning off. You need to be eating more energy than you're burning off so your body can build this tissue. Um, but to become leaner and to lose body fat, you need to be eating less. Um, so this can lead to all sorts of these different um, behaviors and, and um body dissatisfaction you know again it's shown in the research that i'm sure a lot of people listening to this will know about the kind of bulking and cutting idea of dieting um and a lot of you will resonate with with when i say that you have a cyclical nature of body dissatisfaction in the case that when you're bulking and trying to get bigger you think you feel a bit better about the size of your muscles but you are now dissatisfied with the level of body fat that you're carrying 
But then, so then you start doing the cutting side and you start losing weight, you start restricting your food intake a bit and you start to feel a bit better about your body fat levels, but now you're small and not as muscular enough. And, you know, and it, it, I think it's quite easy to see how that can um, spiral out of control when you start to connect to your self-worth to the way that you look. And um, finally, one I want to touch on is orthorexia. Um, orthorexia, again, is not... Um, officially diagnosable but i think it's probably one from my my opinion my personal opinion it's one um form of disordered eating that is probably more um it's a lot more common than we think it is um and especially in the fitness community Orth orthorexia is basically defined as the um restrict rules about around good and bad foods so somebody can't eat certain foods and, and the the classic case that a lot of people will understand when i say this is is clean eating the kind of gym culture narrative that certain foods are clean uh, you know implying that other foods are dirty other foods are, are wrong and bad and um they're bad for you and and you're you know, if you eat them you're you technically are, you're you're they're kind of linking to you're a bad person if you eat them you know, you're you're weak-minded you're not you know the, all the, these narratives of you know you've cheated on your diet you're you know uh, there's all this narrative of, of negativity around certain foods and other foods are fine and they're good and you can feel great if you're eating them and they're often the less calorie dense foods. But if you eat these more calorie dense foods, these, these you know, dirty foods as so to speak as you know, inverted commas again, then you're failing. You're a bad person or you're having a lapse in your diet. You're, you know, there's all this narrative around the idea that you're a bad person if you eat these foods. So I think, you know, the fitness community and th those, those behaviors, those ideas are almost breeding this orthorexia behavior. Um, and one thing I really want to, to stress about, especially, you know, these two in particular is, these aren't diagnosable yet, but that doesn't mean you can't get help for them. Um, if you go to a doctor and talk about you know, these, these disordered eating patterns and stuff, they should be able to um, link you to a local charity or to, you know, beat the UK's leading um, eating disorder charity. They have stuff that they can help you with. Or you could even just go to a counselor or, or anyone you know who's, who's a professional who can help you with this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so you know, it, just because this isn't diagnosable, you know, if you if you are struggling with this and you want to get help, you can. And next is body dysmorphia. Um, I don't want to go too much into this because I know I've been speaking a lot here, but um, basically the the, di the um, definitions of body dysmorphia um, or body dysmorphic disorder, which is the kind of official diagnosis of body dysmorphia, is um, a mental disorder characterized by an extensive preoccupation with perceived appearance flaws. So BDD sufferers often spend many hours a day thinking about their appearance and frequently engage in rituals to improve or hide the body areas of concern. So classic cases of um, BDD can be um, the, the way your the way your face looks, the you know, maybe um, if you're balding or um, if you've got body hair that you don't like, or you, it can be anything um, really. But you know, it's just the idea that there's something wrong with your body and you can't stop thinking about it. You always think about it and um, you're, f you're frequently obsessing over, um, I don't know, using different skincare routines or um, you're trying to do, do something to, to help your hair grow back or, or whatever it is, you're, or wearing clothes in order to stop people seeing certain parts of your body um, that can take over your life and have that negative impact. And um, secondly, I wanted to talk about muscle dysmorphia, which is a specifier for body dysmorphia. So it's a particular kind of body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and it's one that's probably, well, I, I would say certainly more common in the fitness community and in, in athletes and sport people, et cetera. Um, muscle dysmorphia is characterized by the preoccupation that one has low or insufficient levels of muscularity alongside a drive for improvements relating to muscle density, definition, or both. And this leads to a lower overall well-being and the life consumed by muscularity-oriented behaviors. Um, so 
muscle dysmorphia is similar to body dysmorphic disorder, but it's, it's the obsession around the fact that you aren't muscular enough. And I think a really important thing to, to define there is that definition can be a part of that. It's not always size. I think if you talk about muscle dysmorphia or bigorexia that has been labeled before, um, people think, oh, it's just these people trying to get as huge as possible and as massive as possible. But it can also be people who are looking to get as lean as possible and, and shredded to the point, you know, where they, they are feeling weak and um, you know, they, they, can't, they can't move as much as they want to because they've got so, such low body fat percentages that it's having an effect on their life, but it's so important to them. Um, and, and like it says at the, the bottom here, it leads to an overall um, lower well-being and also a life consumed with muscularity oriented behaviors. So that can be, you know, obsessively going to the gym lots of hours of the day, thinking about the gym all the time, thinking about um, going and working out all the time, that having an effect on your social life. So you, your friends ask you to go out for a, a meal or your friends want to go um, out for a drink or they just want to spend the day with you and you and you know this person can't do that because they need to go to the gym they need to make sure they're getting their meals in that they have you know, um, you know th these these ideas and um if that's having a, that profound negative impact on you and is making your life difficult and hard and, and you upsetting you making your well-being go down you're making you feel upset obviously that can have some really negative impacts and all three of these intertwine um, so there's, you know, this debting behavior um, is a really common um, one that's seen, particularly between exercise addiction and disordered eating. So they seem to have this kind of reciprocal and reinforcing nature. So they make each other stronger. So you know, if you if you exercise more, you find, oh, I'm losing a, a bit, uh, I'm losing the weight that I want to lose or whatever it is. Um, and then you think, oh, actually, if I eat less as well, then that'll that'll do that. And then if I exercise more, that'll that'll help even more. And if I if I eat even less, that'll help even more. And it kind of spirals, and, and it can go both ways, so to speak. You know, with like muscle muscularity oriented disordered eating, it could be you know, oh, I'm I'm, I'm lifting more weights, um, that's going to help me get bigger. Um, so, and also I might need to eat a, a bit more protein. So that's going to whatever, or even, you know, it can turn to steroid use, um, in the fact that, you know, I, that I've maximized everything I can here. What else can I do? You know, this debting behaviors cause it to spiral upwards. You know, where else am I going to go? Um, and you can lead to steroid use and it does in a lot of people. And also this body ideals. I spoke about this earlier, this idea how body dysmorphia, the, the way that we look or how concerned we are about our, our body um, can, can cause disordered eating and can cause exercise addiction or both of them and can reinforce both of them. Um, so, you know, the, the one I gave earlier was about the masculine ideal, but also there's the, you know, the, the female um, ideal body that's, that's put in media, you know, whether that's, you know, you know it changes over time, but whether that's, you know, the, the thin waist and, and large hips or whatever it is, it was, that can, that can drive people to, to want to, to diet, but also want to, you know, um, gain weight and, and improve their muscle mass around their, like their bum and their legs. And, and, you know, and, and it can cause, again, it can almost cause this kind of muscle dysmorphia behavior, this idea of um, you know, needing to get bigger, but also needing to get smaller at the same time. And you have these contrasting behaviors that are almost impossible and then can lead to you know, all sorts of things like you know, use of plastic surgery or drugs or whatever it is. Um, you know, these three um, behaviors can intertwine and create this kind of you know, these, this concoction of issues that can come up. So what can we do? Um, again, speaking to coaches and speaking to people who um, are you know, going through this um, or you know, people who are, who are trying to help people, um, one of the questions I often get, or not even question, just a statement, is that they're afraid of, you know, how am I supposed to help these people? Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, it's all good and well, you're telling me that these are issues that I need to be looking out for and, and stuff, but like, how do I actually do anything? And if, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this agree, agree that that's the question that they had. Um, so I kind of have three statements here that are really important. Um, first off is that you do not need to fix people. Um, I am not in any way asking you to sort the people's lives out or to fix something that's wrong with them or to, to do anything like that. So immediately get that out of your head. That is not your 
responsibility or your job. And to support that, you know, you, you do not need to become a clinician. I'm not asking you to understand disordered eating the same way that a psychologist or a psychotherapist would, or, you know, the, or with exercise addiction or with body dysmorphia. You know, I'm not trying to get, you don't need to, to have this profound understanding. What we want you to do is to be a support for people, to support people in a way. Um, and let me explain exactly what I mean. So currently, I think a lot of people look at it in this perspective, um, which is kind of a, a binary idea. Um, the people who are interested in the research is often explained as a pathogenic way of looking at things. So on the left here, you can see there are healthy people. There are people who don't have any disordered eating, don't have any exercise addiction and don't have body dysmorphia. And on the right, there's the other people who have an eating disorder, have an exercise addiction and um, have body dysmorphia or body dysmorphic disorder. And then there are these risk factors with the, shown by the, the black arrow there that are things that cause people to go from healthy to unhealthy. And people often see it. And when, when people are talking about, you know, this idea of like, what am I supposed to do? Like, how am I supposed to help these people? How am I supposed to say the thing that's going to fix them? This is the thing that they're looking at. They're looking at these, these, this person in their gym or this person, their, their athlete and their team, et cetera, who is unhealthy and is in this red square. And they need to say something that, puts them into the green square or they have these these green square athletes um, and they need to stop these these this black arrow from causing them to go into the red but is, that is not the case um, they are not binary that that is the work of that's a way of looking at it as a clinician almost or as a i suppose as a researcher in some way where you're looking at like we need to fix these people in the right square and we need to stop these things that are converting people from the green square into the red square. Um, but that's not what we want, what, what I want or any, I think anyone wants you to do. Instead, you need to look at it like this. So this, again, if you're interested in the research, is looking at it in a salutogenic um, way, um, which is basically um, kind of a posh word for almost like looking at it as like a spectrum. So on the left side there, again, are the healthy, so to speak, people, people who don't have any issues with their eating, their exercise, or the way that they feel about the way that their body looks. And on the right side, there's the full blown people with eating disorders with like diagnosable exercise addiction, diagnosable body dysmorphic disorder or muscle dysmorphia, whatever. But there's also this midpoint, um, and the, the important thing about this, this, uh, this spectrum is the idea that we can all move across this. Just because you have a, a healthy behavior around it, even, even yourself, I'm sure that there's not many people here listening who at no point in their life have they had a bit of a, a poor body image, maybe going up to a, a holiday and you think, oh, I need to lose a bit of weight. Um, and maybe the way that you do that, because it's, it's kind of accepted in, in society, is you start skipping breakfast or you skip lunch or you only have like a piece of fruit for you know you, you these behaviors that are you know, kind you know, kind of um definitively they are kind of disordered in a way they're not you know uh, you're forcing yourself to do something you feel like you need to do it you know to, so to a point they are somewhat disordered and um, but obviously not on the full scale of an eating disorder where it's become so extreme that it's taken over your life. It's just this, this, this phase. Well, even people who have these, have the eating disorder, you know, myself, I have, I have an eating disorder. Um, you know, even people who have the full diagnosis aren't always on that right hand side. You know, they may have this, you know, the period that you meet them or see them or whatever, they may be at that extreme right hand side, but they move across, you know, some days they might feel a bit okay about the way their body looks. So maybe they move a bit more towards the middle. Um, in the same way that some of the athletes that you know who, are, who have this healthy uh, mindset or this, you know, or haven't got some form of um, diagnosed dis diagnosed disorder, um, may some days be like, oh, I think I need to skip me the meal, or I didn't eat very good, so I'm going to do a little bit of extra um, exercise to burn off again in, in air quotes this this food that I ate. Um, 
so instead, when you look at it like this, what we're asking for you to do is not to fix people. What we're trying to do is create an environment where we can help people um, either A, if they are in a healthy or midpoint and they come up to some kind of stressor, something comes in their life that might might make them usually move towards the right, you create an environment that can help people um stop that limit that or even help them bring it back to the left um and you know secondly is the people who are in that right hand side or in the midpoint give them opportunities support them in a way where they can start to move back to the left or at least just you know, give them the bridge to attempt to move back towards that healthy or even just to the midpoint um so that's a really important thing to kind of specify here um and actually, before, before I wrap up, I just want to say that, uh, you know, ways that you can do this, you know, starting that conversation can be difficult sometimes. Um, but a really good standpoint is actually just using this talk, use this presentation, what I've just spoken about today. Uh, say, you know, share this to your athletes, share this with someone that you're, you're worried about or whoever, you know, share it to the whole group, share it to your, your fellow personal trainers at the gym, et cetera. Um, you know, and start that conversation and you know, a really good tip that I recently spoke about on a podcast again for, for my own minds podcast um, for our eating disorders awareness week. Um, we spoke about a really good tip for people who are working in gyms or, or, you know, work with, with exercises and athletes and want to help in, in this kind of supportive manner is when you have your check-ins with your clients, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever it is, tell them from the get-go that you're starting, you've decided you're going to change the way you do things a little bit. You want to start implementing a well-being check because, you know, it's all well and good that you want to help them with their diet, with, you know, the way that they eat and the way that um, they exercise. But also you think that as a, as an exercise professional, a big part of what you want to do as exercise is such a kind of one, you know, as we said, like a miracle drug for mental health and mental well-being. You want to monitor that their mental well-being is getting better as well. So every week you're going to either you know, talk to them or you know, you're going to give them a, a handout where they can talk, they can circle the number from one to 10 of how good they feel, you know, how stressed they feel. Um, you know, maybe they have a box where they can write about you know, their, their concerns around their eating or exercise or whatever it is, you know, just giving them that option to reach out if they want to. Um, and then if somebody does reach out and says, I have an issue, again, you don't need to be a clinician. You don't need to, you know, as we go back here, we don't, I don't need you to take this so-called unhealthy person and make them healthy. That's not your job. Your job is to help them move across this spectrum. So one thing you can, you can do if someone says that you're concerned is say, okay, um, you know, be honest if you, if you have to be, if, if you're not, um, say, I don't really know, um, you know, I'm no expert in, in how to help with this, but if you'll allow me, I would love to, to you know, go along with you in, on your journey and try and help you. So that can be as simple as like, um, how about uh, next week or tomorrow or whenever, whenever you want to do it? And we spend some time at the computer or, you know, just sat next to each other and we, we Google the beat website and try and find some of the things that they have on there. Or we Google local eating disorder units, or we, we learn about just exercise um, addictions or, or whatever it is. You, you show them this, this, um, this presentation, even you send them this and say, you know, is this something that um, you, you resonate with? And then, and then look for support, either you go to the GP or, or, go to one of the charities that I've spoken about or your local eating disorder charity or whatever it is that they're, they're having an issue with. Um, and, and, you know, the, you're, then we're not asking you to fix people. We're just asking you just to point people in the right direction, really, you know, and just allow them to understand that you don't judge them. You don't think that they're, they're wrong. You're not trying to fix them. You're, you know, you know, you're not a clinician. You understand you don't know enough to, to do this. Um, but you want to help them because you know they've reached out to you and, and you want to be there for them and you're going to support them in the ways that you can as you know your I don't know, obviously I don't know everyone who's listening to this even if it's just as a friend you know you just want to help as a friend you just want to help as a your, their personal trainer their coach their whatever it is um yeah so to wrap it up um 
as I said, exercising and taking care of your nutrition, you know, and just fitness in general, in general are not inherently bad. In fact, from, from a general standpoint, they are fantastic. As we spoke about at the start, there are so many physiological and psychological benefits to it. Um, but that does not mean that we should ignore that these things can do damage if they're taken the wrong way. Um, and we don't need to all become clinicians. I'm not asking you to fix people. You don't need to fix someone. If you think you do, you don't. <laughs> Our job is to become a supporter, be someone who can support them if they need help, be someone who allows them to, to know that they can get help from you. You know, they, they can make that first step to you and you're, you're going to be respectful and you're going, you understand, you know, you share with them, you know, maybe some of the times that you're feeling a bit down or you talk about the fact that, you know, you always want them to feel like they can talk to you about these kind of things because you know that they are, an, an issue that can come up for a lot of people you know, that can be such a positive change um, thank you everyone for listening um, thank you to aggression sessions and all the team behind there for inviting me on today uh, i'm really happy to deliver this presentation please do go check out maya minds uh, mayaminds.com if you want to and um, feel free to contact me through the website or on our social media and for anyone interested um, you can feel free to pause on the the references here Awesome. Thank you very much.